Welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to discuss tonight one of the hottest topics in, in, in academic life nowadays, decolonizing academia. Now, let me try to introduce the issue briefly. The three or four centuries in which humankind lived in the West's shadow are officially over, especially with the most recent blows uh, to the European and, and US hegemony. Yet, the issue of the pervasive and persistent impact of imperialism, not least through the permeation of Western worldviews in the former colonies, has been raised with novel urgency. Gurminda Bambara's work has been at the forefront of the recent mobilization for a radical decolonizing of social practice, including in science and higher education. Tonight, we are honored and excited to host her as our distinguished guest speaker within the guest lecture series at the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies. Welcome. Professor Bambra, we're really very happy to have you with us. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation. I'm looking forward to it. So let me attempt to present the striking radicalism of your position. The role of colonialism in the development of modern society is by now well acknowledged. We have long known that slavery fed the development of European economies. No Manchester without Mississippi, indeed. But in a number of works, most recently in the book uh, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory, which you co-authored with John Holmwood, uh, it was published last year uh, by Polity Press. So you have added a more radical claim. You argue that to, to rethink modernity, we need to rethink social science. We need to transform the sociological imagination. This is the case because social science, as it developed in parallel with the historical practices of imperial expansion, of colonialism, did not simply serve that expansion did not help it, did not enable it, but was, so it was not just maliciously used to legitimate oppression, but social science was constituted by that oppression and thus has remained constitutively deficient in serious ways. In other words, colonialism has so deeply affected social science that in fact, we don't have the means of performing the emancipatory critique to which we social scientists are in principle committed. And this deficiency, you note, cannot be overcome by adding missing elements. What we need to do, you note, is to transform social science. Now, if I have misconstrued your position, now is the time to object, because this revolutionary thesis is what I would like us to focus on tonight. Did I? It's, it's not misconstrued. I think I would perhaps present it slightly differently because it's not straightforwardly. We can talk about the oppression that comes out of colonialism, and that's a topic. But when we talk about colonial histories, in part, what we're talking about is that the social sciences have been established on the basis of acknowledging particular histories, whilst there were also other processes that were happening at the same time, but not seen to be significant. And those tended to be those associated with colonial colonialism. And it's the failure to take seriously colonial histories in the construction of the social sciences that leads to the deficiencies in being able to address problems in the present because we haven't got a proper accounting of the past. 
in terms of being able to intervene more effectively in the present. So it's much more epistemological rather than normative, I think. Very well, very well. So um, let us start with first things first. Let's clarify the object of this endeavor. You know, social science, even in its most narrow scope uh, of social theory, is a very diverse entity. Um, I would agree that, uh, let's say, mainstream economics is guilty of every flaw attributed to it, no matter how outlandish. But we also have critical theory as part of the Occidental social science. So th the issue is how do you establish the common denominator that allows you to articulate or to discern a distinct object that is in need of transformation, of decolonizing? That's my first question to you. So I think, you know, so when we think about the social sciences, they often appear to us as perhaps nothing more than the aggregation of discrete undertakings. You know, there, as you say, there's lots of different ways of doing social science. But I would suggest that there are two things that the social sciences share and that they do share an absence. And the absence is the address of colonial histories. And they also share a common focus on modernity within which this absence is implied. So if we think about the work that Habermas has done in terms of presenting this idea of the way in which the you know, sociology itself is seen to be the discipline that structures the social sciences, it's both a social science, but it also structures the relationships between the social sciences. And on one side, in effect, you have politics and economics that deal with the rational and the structural. And then on the other side, you have sociology, which deals with the social, but, the, but sociology also organizes the relationships between the political, economic and the social. Now, whilst these are presented as, in a sense, the way in which the disciplines are organized, the thing that I would want to point to is that the social that they are all committed to is the modern social. It's not just the social and it's the modern social without recognition of colonialism. And to the extent that colonialism is taken into account within the social sciences, I would say that anthropology possibly takes it somewhat into account. But anthropology is seen as distinct from these other disciplines which create the very particular core of social science. And what's missed is that if you were to take a step back and think that it's not just uh, the difference between politics, economics and sociology on the one hand is seen to be the modern, anthropology is seen to be the traditional, and then history from the humanities provides the basis of thinking about the, the context from which these uh, disciplines emerge. But the dividing line between the modern social and the traditional social sciences is not tradition and modernity, or rather that's presented as the dividing line, but what connects them is colonialism. There's a colonial frame within which we can come to understand that the making of societies as modern or as traditional is produced through colonial relationships. And not to acknowledge those connections, I think, is 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 the common absence amongst the social sciences. And what's needed is an address of the modern, not as the modern traditional divide, but to think about how the modern comes to be and therefore to think about it in terms of the colonial modern. OK. Can you still hear me? I'm not. Yeah. OK. Um, very well, let us uh, now uh, get uh, more specifically into the project of, of, of transformation uh, that you have in mind. So in what way have colonial practices, so as I said, not only use social science uh, for nefarious political goals, not least through these omissions and silences, but have been constitutive of that knowledge, as is your more radical claim, how they have shaped social theory, how should we understand that? So I think, I mean, within my earlier work, I focused on the idea of modernity specifically and here the understanding. So when I began my research in modernity, you know, 
I looked at what a lot of people had to say about it and whether they were Marxists or barbarians or postmodernists or from whatever spectrum they came from, there were two things that everybody seemed to agree on in their understanding of modernity, even when they disagreed on everything else. And the two things that they all agreed on was that modernity was something that emerges within Europe and it creates a, a temporal rupture, a break in time between a traditional agrarian past and a modern industrial present. And that that rupture is located within Europe, which is culturally distinct from the rest of the world. And that the outcome of modernity is a process of diffusion or dissemination of the ideas of the modern to the rest of the world. People don't often talk about what the processes are that carry these ideas to other parts of the world. And so that was something that intrigued me. But also I was interested in this idea of the way in which the social sciences are so explicitly organized in terms of ideas of rupture and difference. And I thought, well, what would it, I, I just didn't believe that that was how history or, or societies are organized in terms of these radical differences. And I was interested in the connections and then thinking about how would we rethink the social sciences if we were to acknowledge the history of connections that actually locate Europe in the global world before the world becomes global. So the traditional understanding within sociology is always that um, you know stuff happens within Europe that travels around the world and in that process the global is created. But if I can give a couple of examples maybe to sort of say how I think this makes a difference. So if we think about the Industrial Revolution, you know, so the two events that are seen to create modernity, the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution, the political and economic revolutions that come to define what the modern is. Well, the Industrial Revolution, you know, if you really push people, where does it begin? It begins in Europe. No, but really, where in Europe? It begins in Britain. If you ask them where in Britain it begins, the most common response I've ever had is Manchester and Lancaster. You know, the cotton mills of Manchester, as you were saying. And as you introduced this earlier, Albena, you were saying, you know, there is no Manchester without Mississippi. And indeed, there is no Manchester without India first, because that's where cotton comes from, as does the technology of how to dye and weave it. You know, it's the, the, the raw material is grown in the southern states of the US by Africans who have been taken there as part of the European trade in human beings. That raw material is brought to Manchester where it's turned into cloth and that cloth is sold around the world, usually at the point of a gun because it's of inferior quality to cotton produced elsewhere. So there have there were already global connections prior to Manchester being able to become the origin of the Industrial Revolution. And yet, if we start from Manchester, we have faced these existing relationships, which are largely based in colonial terms, and we imagine industrialization happening spontaneously within Europe, and then creating capitalist global relations, when actually there are colonial global relations that underpin the very possibility of the emergence of, cap of industrialization and then capitalism. So that's one way in which I think that we need to sort of rethink the, the, the social sciences in terms of the economic. And I can also give an example of the political, but I'm also happy to defer that to a bit later if you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very intrigued by, by this epistemological justice claims about the epistemological injustice and, and the endemic deficiency of social science so if you could tell us about this, you know, the, the, the five fictions in order to understand what are the main knowledge claims that underpin the decolonizing argument. So the, the five fictions come out of the recent book, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory. And just to give a sense of what we hope we did in the book is that where, you know, so I've read and taught the work of Tocqueville, Marx, Weber, Durkheim and Du Bois for a long time, and both of us have. So this is a book written with John Homewood. And we were interested in the way in which the ideas and understandings of these thinkers are so central for sociology and, and social theory. 
and the fact that these thinkers lived and worked and thought at a time at times of colonialism and it can't be the case that they didn't ever comment on colonialism and you know they did comment on it and what was interesting to us was both what what they saw about their time how they interpreted those processes how their understanding of their time comes then to be effaced in much of the secondary literature on their work so that the work that they have done in terms of thinking about these issues so Tocqueville for example writes not massively but sufficiently on Algeria he writes on slavery and abolition he writes on democracy in America but if you ask people what do they know of Tocqueville it's democracy in America and if we ask people what do you know about democracy in America it's usually about the counterposing of the political form of democracy within the US counterposed to that of France and thinking about the relationship between modern democracy and the and France having to establish democracy out of its feudal remnants and and so on so that's all well and good and there's a chapter within democracy in America which is titled the chapter on the three races it's a very long chapter at the end of volume one and in abridged editions of Democracy in America, that chapter is often excluded. It's just cut out. And yet Tocqueville in his correspondence with his co-collaborator uh, Gustav Beaumont has said that you, you will understand nothing of democracy in America if you do not read what it is that I have to say in the light of this chapter on the three races, because that's what gives substance to everything else that I'm saying. And this chapter is actually quite an extraordinary chapter in terms of thinking about the relationship between European settlers, indigenous populations, and Africans who've been brought to the US in the condition of enslavement. And his reflections on the relationships between them, between those three groups, and what that then says about the possibility of democracy, which he recognizes as only possible or as only happening for European settlers and not others, should really enable us to then think about what the limits of democracy are and what the limits of democracy within our understandings have been to the extent that we fail to take seriously the structured exclusions that are at its heart. So it's not that indigenous people and Africans were contingently absent from democracy as it comes to be established and thought about in, in the US context, but they're actually structurally excluded from its very possibility. So now we can't just say when we see an exclusion, oh, let's include people. Inclusion is not the answer to domination. And, and having and hopefully that sets out why. That's that, that's brilliant. Uh, that do, dovetails with um, what I call in my work the, the paradox of emancipation. That you know to be included in an unjust system does not advance us very much. Um, so I would like uh, to to press uh, this argument a little bit further into your proposal for um, taking care of epistemic injustice uh, uh, and, and how to reform the very system of, of, of thought and what counts as valid knowledge, right? Um, okay, it is true, it is very well known that virtually all of the early political thinkers and theorists of liberal democracy, Tocqueville, John Stuart Mill, Max Weber, uh, were not just Eurocentric, but ardent and unscrupulous advocates of colonialism and social imperialism. And yet, in, in terms of thinking of the validity claims of social science, epistemic validity, what would you make of the strands of reflexive critique of science? that have been developed within Occidental thought. One such example is the critique of instrumental rationality developed within the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, the tradition within which I work. 
we have Horkheimer and Adorno's dialectic of enlightenment that, you know, stresses that progress and, and, and decay are, are in parallel and entangled. Um, but we don't even have to deviate so far away and stay within, um, you know, traditional um, uh, remit of, of social science. Remain, let's say, with Max Weber. Uh, there is hardly a harsher criticism of Occidental reason than Weber's discussion of the irrationality of increased rationalization of modern Western societies in his thesis about the disenchantment that modernity triggers and eventually entraps us in the iron cage of systems based on purely teleological efficiency, rational calculation and control. Um, this is not something that Weber celebrated. Actually, he denounced Western civilization in no uncertain terms, describing it as a world of, I'm going to quote this beautiful wording, a world of specialists without spirit, sen as sensualists without heart. He calls it a nullity. So he calls Western civilization a nullity that imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never be before achieved. So he, he's been very dismissive, in fact, of the purported glory of the West. Uh, but um, even more relevant to your analysis is his lecture, uh, Science as a Vocation, which you, you mentioned in the book, you reference in the book. And there, Weber highlights uh, the limits of scientific knowledge, speaks about the historical nature of knowledge, uh, the particularity of its uh, insights, its inability to grasp the whole or to establish objectivity. So he's very deeply critical of Western social science. And in fact, in that particular work, um, he comes to the dramatic conclusion that science is meaningless because it gives no answer to the only important question, what shall we do and how shall we live? He states there that the highest aim of science is, I'm, I'm going to quote again, because these are just gems. Uh, so the highest aim of science is exploring the devil's ways to the end in order to realize his power and his limitations. So he's a, a really critical thinker there. So for Weber, moreover, realizing these limitations leads to an ethic of responsibility. So my question is, how is this kind of critical position still tainted or deficient? Isn't the omission of such strands of reflexive critique of science that are available within Occidental science, in the portrayal of social science that we are set out to decolonize, isn't that very omission tantamount to epistemic injustice, if I can really push the point very hard? So, I mean, I think, that in uh, the writing of the book, we sought to be generous readers of the scholars whose work we were engaging with. So the book isn't about criticizing them or taking issue with them from any particular sort of position. What we sought to do in the book is locate the thinkers in their time and think through what they did refer to, what they left out, and then what difference that makes. So if we take Weber, for example, I mean, the, the classic way in which Weber is used within the social sciences and across the social sciences, you know, his, his concept of the state and this idea that the state operates the legitimate monopoly on violence within a particular territory. And, you know, this is the classic definition and this understanding is drawn from an understanding of the state as it emerges in Europe at a particular sort of time. What so Weber recognizes that, and he also recognizes that European states are not limiting the exercise of their power or their monopoly over violence to the borders of, of their national states, they're exercising this power upon other populations and in other territories. And indeed, he advocates that for Germany to become a nation, it's not sufficient for it to be a nation, it has to be a world power. And to be a world power, it has to exercise 
power and violence over others who are not part of the nation. So his concept of the state is about limiting the use of violence or having the monopoly of violence within a territory. And yet his politics, if you like, is about exercising violence on others. The problem here becomes that the use of violence within a territory upon your citizens has to be organized in terms of issues of legitimacy and accountability. So you are accountable to your citizens, you have responsibility for them. The exercise of violence outside the territory is both illegitimate in his own terms, and yet nonetheless he advocates it, but also there can be no legitimacy for that exercise. So this is one of the ways in which Weber both recognizes colonial relations, he recognizes the ways in which colonial processes are operating in the world, and yet the only, but he draws a limit around the nation and suggests that his sociology is to be developed in terms of an understanding of what's going on within this particular territory, as if the rest doesn't matter. And my argument and our argument in the book is that this exercise of violence upon others matters. How does it matter? How does taking seriously this violence that's perpetrated upon others, what should that cause us to rethink about questions of legitimacy, accountability, in both for his own time, but also in the present, because we use Weber's understanding of the state as our blueprint. And okay. yet it, it sort of hides all this. So how can we transform our understandings so that we can be more accountable for the exercise of violence in our name, but without any accountability? that continues to go on in the present. So I think that's why even if Weber provides us with some resources, we would suggest that, we're, that what we do in the book is to take issue with, if you like, the conceptual architecture of the social sciences that has been established by these thinkers. And we're taking issue with that rather than them straightforwardly as individuals, although of course we have critiques of them as individuals as well. But the object of our critique is the conceptual architecture of the social sciences that's been established on the basis of understandings that fail to take colonial processes seriously. So help us understand how social science would look differently if we follow um, your proposal. So what kind of theory would um, properly incorporate colonialism? Um, if we undertake this transformation, um, how would we think about critique differently? What would Weber say about modernity or about legitimate power if we were to adjust, you know, to perform these transformations? Can you get us a, give us a taste of, of how would social science look differently? Well, I think, I mean, in terms of what Weber would say, well, Weber said what he said. The issue now is what, what are we going to say? And right. I think that we need to sort of think about, you know, and so in a sense, what we hope we've done with the book is possibly open up the possibility of new and different conversations so that A, we don't always have to return to these figures, but B, if we wish to return to these figures, we can also perhaps take them in different sorts of ways, because the work of situating them within the colonial context and taking seriously those aspects hasn't really been done. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done. But let me pick up this issue of what difference would be made. I mean, one of the arguments, and, and I should just preface this with, the, with saying that my interest in sociology and social theory emerges out of my interest in the problems of the present. So I'm interested in questions of injustice and inequality in the present, and my concern is how best can we mobilize the resources of the social sciences to enable us to intervene more effectively in the address of these problems? And so in that context, if we say that one of the key problems that we've been confronting within Europe, for example, has been what was, what was termed the refugee crisis, I would rather call the crisis for refugees, that has occurred over the last few years. And one of the ways in which this discourse then comes to be established is that these people, even 
by some scholars on the left, so people like Wolfgang Streich and others, have come to term them as invaders, you know, and that language is being used in the context of arguing that the patrimony of European nations is a national patrimony and it ought not to be available to others because those others haven't participated in the creation of this particular patrimony. My argument would be that if we understand European states not as having been nations, but for the most part as having been empires or involved in colonial projects, then we would understand that the wealth of Europe has not been created endogenously through the labour of Europeans, but rather has been also through the appropriation of colonial wealth, of the taxation of colonial subjects, the extraction of their labour and resources and so on. And so in that sense, it's not a national patrimony that European states have, it's a colonial patrimony. To the extent that it's a colonial patrimony, maybe that could open up the possibility for us to think about how we relate to those who seek our help often because we have also been responsible for creating the conditions of the need for them to move, whether that's through war, famine, climate change, etc. And we could think about our responsibilities differently if we were to acknowledge that the state that we are in has not historically been a national state. It's been an imperial state. And this is true even for countries in Scandinavia and Eastern Europe who often wish to disassociate themselves from the idea of a European colonial past by saying, well, we didn't have empires. They may not have had empires, but they certainly participated in what I would call emigrationist colonialism, which is that they sent their populations to settle the lands that we now call the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and money remittances were sent back for the development of those countries from that labour. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, but still, is this an epistemological solution or it is just a political corrective? Um, so my question would be to see whether, whether these resources are not already available within um, Occidental social science, and I would naturally seek them within critical theory. Um, so it is true that none of the original authors who started this tradition of thought addressed colonialism. They were, um, you're right in your criticism, uh, they were preoccupied with you know, the possibility of authoritarian rule within Europe, um, Nazism, uh, autocratic, uh, you know, the Soviet uh, regime. Um, and yet, it does not automatically mean that if they have this omission in terms of the themes that they develop, they do not develop the conceptual resources or the methodological resources for a critique of forms of domination, including colonial. Um, the persistence of, of, of the colonial um, the violence. So, um, well, take, um, I don't know, take uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, statement, uh, uh, you know, that um, every uh, document of civilization is also a document of barbarism, you know, very famously that. Uh, that is very much open to criticism of the categories within which we, um, interact as a, as a civilization uh, or um, even more radically uh, uh, if I can think of the most radical contribution of critical theory that would be and indeed in the direction of this epistemic pluralization in that uh, and transformation that you're calling for um, For instance, Adorno um, gave up altogether theory, but not critique, because he became aware, uh, and actually inspired by Kant's critique of judgment, he became aware that any critique would be totalizing in some way, no matter how much you pluralize it. Because if you pluralize it all the way down, there is no more theory. There is only forms of critique of social injustice. So 
this distinction between critical theory and social critique, shouldn't that be enough to allow for emancipation without foreclosure, without exclusion and epistemic injustice? Uh, so I wonder in what sense is this still insufficient to deliver us to the kind of analysis that you advocate? I mean, I think its insufficiency rests in the fact that it can't really break out of its own modernist presumptions. So it understands emancipation as associated with the modern, with modernity, and whether it regards modernity as a finished project in terms of like the end of history thesis that you have, or as an unfinished project with the Habermasian thesis, it's still nonetheless a project that understands itself separate from colonialism. So if we understand the modern world to, to indicate empirical historical progress, but we don't take into account the deaths that were established in the basis of creating the modern, then it's almost as if we're trying to say that emancipation can be for us here in the West without us having to take into account the fact that the very possibility of our lives has been made possible through the subjugation and oppression of others. There is no freedom in Europe without the enslavement of Africans or the subjugation of colonial subjects. And so in that sense, if all you're doing is focusing on freedom and the emancipation of the individual, without taking into account how your emancipation is associated with your subjugation of others, then it's an emancipation that I'm not actually that interested in. Because I have, I believe in an ethic to, you know, that has a sense of a responsibility to take account of the, to understand that the conditions of my life have been made possible through histories that have made other people's lives unlivable. And so if I'm to take any sort of serious account of my emancipation, it cannot be separated from the processes that enable me to think in these terms and the ways in which they make life for others unlivable. These are inseparable. And the failure to acknowledge that connection means for me that the resources of any theory that focuses so solipsistically upon itself without any reflection on the histories that have produced the conditions to enable it to exist is just inadequate. But exactly in the, the dialectic of, the of enlightenment, Hor Harman and Adorno make exactly that point, that there is no uh, unambiguous uh, progress uh, towards uh, you know, li liberation of humanity. It's, it's, it's very much entangled with subjugation and violence that's exactly the big one of the biggest contribution of so then let's theory. take that seriously let's take that seriously and think about reparations nowhere within critical theory is the focus on accounting for the subjugation or the oppression that has enabled theories of enlightenment to emerge for me the theory is meaningless if there isn't a practice that is associated with it and so if one wishes emancipation surely it should be emancipation from the horrors that have produced you yeah i, I would believe that uh, where these um, part of our audience uh, the, the authors would admit because the, I, I believe this is in the logic of their inquiry and their thinking but interestingly um, it's not in the substance of their work so whilst yeah, yeah. it may be in the logic, I'm happy for it to yeah. be in the logic, but the issue is the substance. Um, okay, I have promised to open soon for the audience. However, I would like to raise one issue that of, always comes uh, in these debates. So the typical objection to any criticism of, of, of the Enlightenment's heritage, um, that is the ideas of autonomy, emancipation, freedom, universal and uh, uh, unconditional rights. Uh, the, the typical objection um, goes something like this. Even if these ideas originated within Western Europe, you know, with all the history of subjugation and violence, the scope of validity 
of these ideas surpasses their geographical origin. Not only that, but they have effectively been used by the anti-colonial movement. So some fear that questioning the heritage of the Enlightenment right now, especially when the liberal order that kind of maintained or pushed those values as its own philosophy of history, as, as this liberal order is waning, this would weaken these invaluable sources of empowerment that are needed in the struggle for injustice around the world. So this is the typical objection. So in other words, uh, to rephrase that, are we going to abandon the idea of freedom because of the abuses in its name? When in fact, so many have relied and still rely on that very idea to free themselves. So I don't think anybody required a European conceptualization of freedom in order to free themselves from oppression. You know, I mean, there are sort of, you know, from anybody, you know, the colonialism has been resisted from its very beginnings. And we have this documented in any number of ways. And that resistance is something that was often used as a, a way of sort of justifying further violence against these populations, used as the basis. So resistance to enslavement was used by Europeans to justify enslavement because these people were using violence to resist something. So there's ways in which the European tradition of enlightenment actually justifies its own uh, violence through misrecognizing other people's commitments to wish to live free, separate from, you know, not within, not by being subordinated to European wishes for them, but their own wishes to live differently. And so I think there's a lot to be learned about what freedom actually means if we look at the resistance that there has been to European colonialism and to construct our narratives from these other sources that are also available. I think it's absolutely um, and I also don't think that ideas have an ethnicity. So I don't use the language of Occidental social science or Western social science. I think effectively there has been a form of social science that emerged in a particular place and it's been taken up and accepted by many people around most of the world. And I think that its conceptual underpinnings are problematic, whether people are using it in particular ways here, there or anywhere else. So the issue isn't arguing for an Eastern social science or a, uh, you know, a differently organized social. It's arguing for the need for a transformation of our understandings, which requires that, you know, which requires us having to learn from others. And one of the things that I find so interesting in these sorts of conversations and these sorts of spaces is the utter resistance to think that Europeans can learn anything from anyone else and that the resources have to be available within one's own tradition for them to have any uh, respectability or validity. It's like, why be so parochial about this? Why be so committed to a frame of reference that comes out of a history where you're not even willing to recognize the history that it comes out of and make amends for it? But you're so tied to this idea that there is nothing to learn from anybody else. And that I find the most parochial uh, process ever. Um, well, maybe maybe the one is uh, the, the mat the matter of, of practice and, and, and then acknowledging that practice because even the US Constitution is being informed by, uh, you know, so, some of the articles are adapted from um, the Iroquois and the uh, Algonquins. Uh, so, in fact, uh, there is no such thing as, as insulated uh, Occidental modernity. It's been informed very much by non Occidental and pre-modern pre uh, thoughts and practices. And so before I open um, for the audience, I want to give you the opportunity here to clarify for us, because this is a very important debate. It is fast evolving, 
what is the most typical misconception of your work that we should get rid of? Of my work? Yeah. Well, well, well you're typically misunderstood. If, if that exists at all, I just want to give you a chance to well, clear I mean, that. Away. Just, you know, of your so argument. I guess a couple of the key arguments that I would wish to make and would wish to have taken up more extensively are a that European states are not nations they've always been empires or imperial states and we should stop thinking about European states as having a national history and recognize their imperial history and then rethink the politics of legitimacy in the present not in terms of our responsibilities to citizens who can demonstrate belonging to a national past but can demonstrate belonging to an imperial past and see how that opens up the possibilities of politics in the present. And secondly, often when I talk about the, the issue of modernity and make the arguments for the need to understand modernity as colonial modernity, often people say, yes, but wasn't it just really the Europeans? And it's like, no, it wasn't. Right. Um. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have agreed to continue this debate uh, and uh, in view of, of, of publishing it in the next issue of Emancipations. Uh, now, let us see the questions from the audience. Please use either wave your hand or use the, the, the raise hand option to signal to me. Um, okay, I see, let me see here. Who is Katerina Mertz? Katerina, go ahead. Um, yeah, okay, first of all, thank you very much. It's been a, it's an absolutely fascinating topic. Um, so I love that you're talking about practice. Now, I know you mentioned uh, reparations. I guess I have a twofold questions, uh, question. So first of all, what do you think sort of Europe can do? Reparations of what kind? How can we sort of May, not make up, but acknowledge the past and sort of move forward. And then secondly, us as students, as current recipients uh, at a British university and maybe future contributors to sort of academia, what can we do? What conversations need to be had to, to progress, I guess? Okay. Do you want me to answer them one by yeah, one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I mean, what can Europe do? It depends what Europe is willing to acknowledge and recognize. So there are different ways in which the question of reparations can be dealt with. M.A. Césaire, when he um, writes the discourse on colonialism, one of the things that he says within that is that, you know, there are sins for which there is no expiation. So this isn't about forgiveness and this isn't about somehow resolving the past or making up for the past. For me, it would be about recognizing the way in which these colonial histories continue to have a legacy in the present through the establishment and the reproduction of particular types of inequalities. And if we were to address inequalities in the present, that would be one way of making reparations for those past histories, because there's no inequality that exists in the present that doesn't have colonial history as part of its, um, as, as, as the basis from which it's emerged. And so if we were to address that, and if we think about it in terms of sort of issues of climate change, for example, the people who are most at effect of climate change and the people who will suffer the most from it and are already suffering the most from it are the populations that have done least in terms of the industries and processes that have produced the changes that are causing these sorts of things. So one of the things that we could do is take responsibility for our modern world to the extent that it's our modern world, it's our colonial modern world that has produced climate change of, of catastrophic climate change. And then think about what it is that we need to do to ensure that other people have the possibility of survival and then possibly more than survival but even survival would be a good thing for for starters 
So in that sense, and also the question of reparations also depends on what it is that people want. So one of the best examples I've seen of the call for reparations has been by CARICOM, which is a, a community of Caribbean nations that have come together to argue for reparations. And they're arguing, well, their argument is, is that Britain appropriated the wealth that came from their enslavement and their exploitation. And it used that wealth to help establish the National Health Service, roads, social institutions, art galleries, education, everything. And they're asking for money to be able to establish social democratic institutions in, in the Caribbean region. Institutions that wouldn't only be available to those who are descended from the enslaved, but also would be available to everybody who lives in the Caribbean. And so in that sense, what I would call social democratic reparations are an important way of thinking about how we address these legacies. It's not an individual process, but a, a, a collective process. And what can we do in the present? I mean, one of so some people call me a post-colonial theorist or attach that label to me. I think the way in which I use the term post-colonial is that I use it as a provocation to always think about the colonial in what it is that I'm thinking about. So I have no commitment to post-colonial theory. I have a commitment to the term post-colonial as a provocation to think of the colonial and to be a sociologist that doesn't not think about the colonial. Okay, thank you. Let's continue. Um, Zoheb Mashwir, please. Zoheb Mashwir, it's your turn. Okay, you probably cannot hear me. Uh, I think we have to allow Mike and would you like to ask your question? The mic is enabled. Hello? I think they've put a comment in the chat. So I can respond to that around on the subject of the liberal world under threat from critique. Is there any reason to assume there's ever been a liberal world to begin with? Well, I wouldn't assume that because I think as you probably uh, understood in terms of what I was arguing that there's a wonderful book called um, Liberalism and Empire by Uday Singh Mehta who talks about the fact that what we understand to be liberalism can't be understood outside of these imperial uh, relations and so we have to think about what has come to be understood as liberalism in that sort of context. Okay, shall we um, continue with Scott Hamilton? Scott, go ahead. Hi, thanks very much for your presentation and uh, I loved your book. And I wanted to know if you had to make a list of to, to warn political scientists to be wary about using these concepts. Some of the ones that came from tonight were like the state, emancipation, democracy, freedom, modernity, but I wondered if you were to make a hit list of things that we as political scientists should be wary of using, what words would be on that list? So again, it's it's not about substituting words for other words. For me, it would be about transforming the concepts so that they're more adequate to the histories that actually produce them. So I don't think that we can work without an, a concept of the state, for example, but to the extent that we take our understanding of the state, that recognizes a history from the Treaty of Westphalia through to the French Revolution, through to the unification of Germany and Italy, and then to decolonization, and just assumes this genealogy as self-evident and doesn't ever ask oneself, well, decolonization, so we have nation states that suddenly come into being, how do they suddenly come into being? Like, What is the context of colonization and what does that mean? for the possibility of new nation states to emerge after colonization. Were the countries that were the colonizers, should they then just be understood as nations at a time when they were colonizing and were actually imperial? So I would argue that actually nation states don't really come into being until the latter half of the 20th century, because that's the period 
when we begin to see a preponderance of nation states on the global uh, within the global context. Prior to that, we don't have nation states. We have imperial states. We have colonized states. We have colonizing states. We have, you know, and so the assumption that it's the nation is makes it impossible for us to understand the nation state in the present. So it's not that we should give up the term the state. We should historicize it more adequately and then think about how that concept would need to be developed and transformed in light of that historical understanding and then see what further resources it opens up once we've done that. And I would say that that's probably true of almost all concepts of the social sciences, that we would need to judge their adequacy to the extent that they are able to account for and address the colonial histories that are also a part of their um, establishment. Okay, very well. Let's uh, continue with the, there is a person who raised their hand very early under the heading decolonizing social science guests. So there is no name, but please, please ask your question. Um, so I'm able to uh, use my mic. So is it me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to know uh, if we relate what has been said tonight uh, to the realm of OST, so ontological security theory, uh, I wanted to know to what degree does uh, that questioning and the decolonization of social sciences that are deemed as Western and the questioning of the Enlightenment ideas uh, pose an ontological threat uh, to the West in the current world. Thank you. Well, I mean, the West is at threat by climate catastrophe. And this is one of the things that comes out through COP26, if you've been following the debates, there's a sudden urgency to how we deal with climate change. And there's a sense that, you know, we can now finally see that the changes that we've produced in the environment and to the climate are beginning to have an effect even on us within Europe. And so, and that they're likely over the next 20, 30 years to have a quite extreme effect upon us within Europe. And so the argument is often organized in terms of what can we do to stop climate change from affecting us or usually our children. And that fails to take into account that climate change is already making life unlivable for many people around the world. So instead of trying to put into place mitigations and adaptations that might make things a little bit better for us in 50 years time, why don't we address the climate change issues that are already making life unlivable for others? That would require a much greater reckoning with our complicity in the production of the changes that are causing um, these issues to, to emerge. And so in that sense, I think that there's, again, a very limited understanding within Europe that Europe is a part of a world. And that world is structured in particular ways as a consequence often of the ways in which Europeans have acted upon that world. And there has to be some taking of responsibility for that history and the presumed threats that are now seen to exist that also make life difficult here in Europe have to be located in the way in which Europe has made life difficult for people in the rest of the world. And so I would be less focused on the ontological threat to Europe than thinking about what the material threats have been that we need to address with some urgency. Okay. I follow with a question in the chat uh, from uh, our colleague in Barcelona, Marta Palacio Vendano. Um, Professor Bambra, what do you think about the term decoloniality, a term very common in the context of Latin American studies developed in the USA? So I think both post-colonial thought and decolonial critique are responses 
to understandings and a, a wish to bring the colonial histories of different regions to be taken more seriously within the social sciences and the humanities more broadly. So I think that uh, that they work incredibly well together and I think they both provide resources that we can use to try and change the ways in which we're thinking about these things. So I think it's a very useful term. Okay. Um, Zohib's hand is still up. Can we hear from you? Zohib, go, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. We can hear okay. you. Yes, I was struggling with my mic. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for answering my previous question. The question that I have now is I've been thinking about the problem of how these um, social science concepts such as the nation state, borders, or the national population, migration, and so forth, that have these imperial and colonialist origins in Europe. How can we grapple with these concepts in the context of um, post-colonial societies or any country that is now in the non-Western world, new nation states coming up, people fighting for borders, uh, trying to assert their independence and so forth. On And of course, like I'm not speaking in terms of support for this sort of nationalism, like I'm from Bangladesh, so we have our own ethno-nationalism and so on. But it becomes clear that these concepts themselves are fundamentally tainted but at the same time, how can we move in these countries, move forward from these ideas when we have taken on these models from the West? And how can we then kind of like have a transformation in Western social science and then transform that into action or like a, a paradigm shift outside it? it seems like the, um, these countries learn to be nation states and now they have to unlearn. So right, uh, it's a burden. No, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think the thing that I would say is that, as I was saying before, that the things that we think of as nation states, if we come to recognize that they were not nation states, but empires, then one thing that that makes possible or is, is for us to understand that when we compare an old nation state with a new nation state, we're not comparing the same thing. We're comparing an empire with a nation. We're comparing a country that was able to become successful through the exploitation of others in order to maintain its internal integrity. So when you have real nation states in the present, that is countries that are not able to have empires or imperial relations, and we compare them to all nation states, the common framing of that within the social science is to talk about them as deficient, as deviant, as you know, not really properly, you know, effectively as deficient nation states. And perhaps if we did this work within the social sciences and says and say that, well, actually, the problems that these new nation states are facing are problems that nation states face when it isn't possible to build your success on the exploitation of others. We have to think about how we're going to be within our own terms and our own resources. And so then what is possible? And that's something that old nation states, i.e. empires which have now become nation states, are having to learn. So the crisis in Europe, with the turn to authoritarianism, to populism and so on, is linked to the fact that now decolonization is beginning to bite in a way that it didn't before. And it's still not biting fully because European countries have maintained forms of financial domination over other parts of the world. So the fact that France holds the gold reserves of nine West African countries in Paris and refuses to allow them access to their own reserves is part of this story. The fact that Britain holds the reserves of Argentina and refused to give the new government access to, to, that, uh, to those reserves because it didn't like the politics of the new leaders and, and so on. So there are forms of financial imperialism which continue the old forms of colonial domination, 
But nonetheless, there has been a break in the pure extractive relation that Europe had had with much of the rest of the world. And so there is a crisis within Europe about how to deal with the fact that it's not getting its resources from elsewhere. And that's having the turn against migrants, against others, the xenophobic nationalism, the authoritarian populism. And if we can't locate that in the colonial histories, then some people might believe that it's true that migrants are a drain on our wealth. It's true that these others, that we shouldn't be helping refugees, that, it, you know, and so we, so these things are not without a stake. And that's partly why I say that I'm not, that none of this for me is about it, its own terms. It's very much about how might it be possible to create a better politics for our present? Because we need it. Excellent. Um, next is uh, another call for, for the person who is listed as decolonizing social science guest. Last opportunity for you to ask a question. Should that be me? I am Maria yeah. Pialara. Hi. I Hello. Hello to both, because I know you both very well. I'm very <laughs> glad to say hello. hello. I, I, just wanted, I, want, I wanted two things. Um, um, uh, uh, both, uh, of course, uh, uh, refer to Gurminder. Is that OK? Should I go on? Yes. 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 OK. Um, I'm quite uh, uh, concerned about the, not because I am in disagreement, but like Hannah Rand had some sort of historical development uh, between the conception of a nation and sovereign nation and empires. Um, have you ever considered, because she agrees that the nation state gave place to empires and not the other way around, as it seems to me. Um, that you're doing, that's one. And then the second is, of course, I'm in, uh, entirely in agreement with the ethical quality um, of all the things that you have said here today, but I want to, 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 to tell you an example of how um, uh, unrealistic this is politically speaking, and this is terrible, I mean, um, as you know, our president of Mexico right now uh, issue a letter to the Spanish uh, president um, like six or seven months ago um, asking for a proper claim of forgiveness from the Spanish to us Mexicans. It was, of course, symbolic. It didn't mean that, you know, there was some sort of following um, money, uh, uh, interactive, uh, uh, I don't know, what do you call it? Uh, um, um, you, you call it the just the reparation, uh, reparation, yes. Um, no, uh, the Spanish reacted very negative, but not only the, the, the uh, politicians, the people. I was very surprised to see how they thought this was just such a stupid, uh, ridiculous. Of course, in my view, they are. This is Spain is um, has a, a inferiority complex because, of course, being <laughs> in Europe, um, having been the most potential empire at some point, um, it was when the English won the war of the invasion uh, by the Spanish. Um, they disappeared, and with the counter-reformation uh, policies they had, um, they didn't they didn't establish themselves as the great potent empire as they thought they should have been. So uh, this is the thing, you know, there are economic interests, political interests of of that that are the ones that have to be criticized powerfully in our speeches because it's never going to happen that um, the empires are going to recognize what uh, the laws and um, and debts and you know the Spanish built up all their colonial cities in uh, on top of our cities 
of the Aztecs. The, 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 I don't know if you knew that. Uh, we don't have any of um, the uh, former ways in which ancient pre-Hispanic societies were built and they had beautiful cities. Sorry. Okay, that was Professor Maria Pia Lara uh, speaking from Mexico, an eminent critical theorist. Gurminda? I mean, thank you so much for that uh, sort of comment, because in a sense, I mean, I'm not suggesting that any of this is going to be easy, not at all. And we also have to recognize that the colonial world that was established that creates the modern world has been, what, 500 years in the making. And formal decolonization has been going on for, what, 70 years. So there's a disparity both in terms of the longevity of the structures that are in need of transformation and the shortness of the time in which there's been a concerted attempt to transform the world. I think we can take hope from the fact that there have been uh, shifts and, and changes, but none of those are in any way sufficient or adequate, and there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. And it won't be easy. Um, next is Anamika Misra. Anamika, go. Uh, hi, Gurminder. Thank you so much for the talk. It was excellent. And um, it left me thinking about a lot of things and to have your texts. Um, I had a question more to do with your work on connected sociologies, actually, especially with the guards do, because you were talking a bit about resistance. And so as you know, researchers and as educators, like as people who teach, Oftentimes when we talk about colonialism and the canon, we often sort of concentrate or more likely to concentrate on the violence of colonialism while underplaying the resistance that, you know, has always existed to colonialism and slavery. And that's one thing which I think connected sociology does very well, where it sort of foregrounds the you know, resistance and the different ways of thinking that have existed. And I was wondering what sort of uh, recommendations or any sort of feed, any sort of like, you know, comments that you would have for those of us who are trying to foreground resistance because it is a lot harder to do that because you know uh, beyond just mentioning the sources and mentioning the conversations given the fact that a lot of young students have an abys have an abysmal understanding of british colonialism especially but also just you know european colonialism so much time goes in explaining the context so how do we balance that where we humanize the people who resisted against slavery and colonialism and actually foreground their resistance more than we foreground the objection or the violence that you know colonialism visited upon them without underplaying what actually is the history and what actually is the reality of it i mean i think as with so many of these things it's not either or it's both and you know, and, and I absolutely agree with you, the need to, you know, one of the reasons I got interested in the Haitian Revolution and have really made that a central part of the work that I do and the teaching that I do is that I think it's precisely important to indicate that these processes did not go uncontested. They were contested at the time. And actually, the French Revolution can't be understood, except that we understand the Haitian Revolution and rethink the French Revolution in light of what happens in Haiti. And then 50 years on from Haiti, you have what is often called the Indian Mutiny, but could be understood rather differently in terms of yet another revolutionary moment that seeks to disrupt the patterns of, of power that are predominant at that time. And what would it mean? to establish a history or an understanding of the world in terms of those moments of resistance. So to think, and, and in that sense, make them not moments, but make them the beginnings of a structural transformation so that you could go from Palmares and the Quilombos in, in the Southern Americas to Haiti and what happens across various plantations in the Southern states, to thinking about the Indian mutiny, to linking that to other moments across the Indian Ocean world, and then developing an understanding that builds to the present in terms of those sorts of contestations and the ways in which people sought freedom, emancipation, equality against the colonial forms that were being imposed upon them. And, you know, as a, th this is work that is to be done. To do it. Very well. 
Um, next is Reda uh, Maharaja, who is a PhD student uh, at the BSS. Go ahead, Reda. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Albena. Um, uh, uh, Bambi, ba sorry, am I, I, I pronounce your name wrong, obviously. Bambi, uh, I had the very good fortune of reading your, your, your text as an undergrad for when I was studying with the LSE. So it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to see you in person today. Wanted, uh, I, I found your, the ways in which you spoke about the uh, necessary to understand the histories of the concepts, such as the state, or, or for example, when we are speaking about the so-called uh, migration crisis very intriguing in a, in a sense that if we don't, if we take the historical aspect out or the temporal aspect out of these concepts, what we are doing uh, is that uh, um, uh, uh, we are treating these concepts and these issues as a matter of fact rather than historically being produced as, uh, by, as an effects of colonial power. One uh, particular text that helped us to think uh, genealogically through this is uh, Provincializing Europe. This was published like in the year 2000, so we are speaking about 22 years now. I was wondering if you would recommend any text that, you know, took the, this task further and deconstructing these colonial concepts, these European concepts that are being, you know, taken as universal, are they provincial and local ever after you know, the publication of that landmark a book uh, 22 years ago? Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. There's, um, I'm just trying to see, I've got it up here. I think it's called World Making After Empire by Adam Getachew. It's a recent book that's come out which seeks to sort of pull together many of the histories of independence struggles in different African and Caribbean countries and rethink our understandings of world making through those processes. So I think that one's called World Making After Empire. Another very good book and, and done sort of differently um, that I would strongly recommend is called Modern Migration Theory by Pio Hansen, who's using the insights of modern monetary theory to think about how Europe has managed its migration crisis and linked to the issue of modern monetary theory. There's the book by Ndongo Sambasila and uh, Fanny Pigot called The CFA on the French colonial currency. And they provide a really interesting history on the establishment of the French colonial currency and the way in which France requires West African states to maintain this currency and maintain it as tied to the French franc, even though the French franc no longer exists and, and so on. And so, you know, we have these absurd situations where those colonial legacies continue in the present, even when the ostensible nation has shifted into another form. So those would be a few recommendations off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Let me add one recommendation for the sake of diversity. Uh, I would throw in uh, Sankar uh, Mithu's uh, Enlightenment Against Empire, uh, in which he argues that um, thinkers such as uh, Diderot, Immanuel Kant, uh, uh, Johann Gottfried Herder developed an understanding of humans as inherently cultural agents and therefore necessarily diverse. So that's, that's a road away from this totalizing category was the nation state uh, because these thinkers rejected the conception of a culture free natural man. Uh, so uh, I, I think there's still a lot of hope within, uh, within the Enlightenment tradition. Um, uh, can I just add, I mean, because that reminds me, there's a more recent book that's come out called The Postcolonial Enlightenment. Um, which is an edited volume, and it's got some fabulous chapters in it. One of them is by a colleague called Arava Muthan, who talks about Hobbes in America, and that's one of the best uh, pieces that I've read about Hobbes and, and so on. Beautiful. Uh, I made a note. Thank you. So uh, finally, a question uh, from Boyan Savage, uh, my colleague. Please, Boyan, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. OK, my my mic now works. Um, thank you so much for organizing this and 
uh, Professor Bumbra, thank you so much for your um, for your insightful contribution. I just wanted, uh, because I'm figuring this is towards the end of your talk, and I just wanted to bring this discussion back maybe to where we started, to decolonizing social science, but in a more maybe specific way. I actually want, I'd like you to speak to our students, in fact, as students, um, in the sense that, um, when we teach, I think, decoloniality and postcolonial um, theory, um, you know, we need to tell our students uh, what these theories, in fact, aspire to and what the goals are. And I, I give them sort of a discourse analytic uh, kind of take on that, as in, well, this is what some prominent um, postcolonial theorists have said. And it's interesting that. Um, you do have people like Robert Young who do frame the goals of um, post-colonial theory in very sort of critical social theory terms, emancipation, empowerment. Um, and our students, I think, are, you know, not just BSS, but, but around the world are sort of young, idealist, sometimes utopian, but radical sort of people. And, and I think that's beautiful. Um, how would you, what would you tell them? Um, what is the goal of um, post-colonial or anti-colonial uh, critique uh, beyond these sort of fairly abstract terms, because they're really good at pushing me in the classroom, you know, well, what does this mean? You know, what would you specifically say about it? And often, by the way, feel unhappy with this uh, attempt to say that critique as such, in fact, imminent critique brings something to the fore, right? They'd like to see some more positive statements, uh, what should be aspired uh, to. So what's your take? Well, my take is a very modest take and it's uh, to leave the world better than you found it. You know, we enter the world and all its problems and what are the problems that we identify and what difference can we make to those problems that we're committed to resolve. And in that sense, if enough of us do this, we will hopefully make a difference that goes far beyond what any of us as individuals are able to do, but by linking in with others can make a more transformative difference to the world so that there is actually a world that remains for future generations. Because the way we're going at the moment, that's looking less and less likely. That's okay. beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, I, uh, an important question in the chat from Elena Paris. Um, what strategy should we effectively use to introduce insights from other epistemological traditions? Because indeed, we do recognize, you know, how laden with violence, uh, you know, the European colonialism is. And yet, what does it mean to introduce insights from other? epistemological traditions. Maybe at this late point, we should just say, uh, read um, Gurminder Bambra's last book, <laughs> but still I will give you the final word to, to um, clarify this important I mean, point. Just to say this briefly again, I guess you, you asked me the question earlier, what's the key misunderstanding or something? And it's also often the idea that I'm not part of the Western epistemological tradition, when in fact, that's the only tradition I've been brought up in, and it's the one that I've learned and, and within which I work. And yet what I seek to do is to transform it within, from within. So it's not that I'm bringing uh, mm -hmm. understandings from anywhere else. I may look different, but I don't have a different education. My education is very much a bog standard British European education. What I'm interested in doing is bringing an understanding of history into the social sciences. And I think that the best social sciences are those that are attuned to the broader histories that have been the basis for their emergence, but are which are unrecognized. So it's not that aspect. And so when I say that we need to learn from others, it's to learn, you know, why are, why are those that we call others here? We're not randomly here. We're here because of these histories that have brought us here. And yet the way in which we're engaged with, as if we were randomly here, and we're here only at the generosity or the behest of those who are the, the legitimate citizens, 
And if we don't recognize the colonial histories, we will maintain these lines of legitimacy and illegitimacy, which continue to divide our societies and make it impossible for us to deal with the issues that are fundamental around inequality, around addressing the injustices that, that exist, and will be caught up in false debates around who belongs, who doesn't, as opposed to addressing the more profound questions of how can we all live well? How can we construct a world in which we can all live well? And that's, uh, you know, and that that doesn't come from anywhere apart from a commitment to a world that ends up being better than what it currently is. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we shall remain committed you know, to finding ways into conducting critique that is deeply historicist and honest and, and self-critical. Um, so thank you for this conversation. It's been inspiring and um, you know, wonderful, wonderful to be with you. Uh, I hope we continue. Thank you so much. It's great to engage with all of you. Really great. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.